Hoy en la taberna de rol vamos a entrevistar a Rob Heinzo, el diseñador de cuarta edición de D&D y diseñador de Thirteenth Age. Era 13, un juego de rol que diseñó con Jonathan Tweet, a quien por cierto también entrevistamos en la taberna. Le vamos a preguntar sobre ese juego que está por sacar su segunda edición en Kickstarter. De hecho, si estás viendo este video, ya podés ir a apoyarlo. Le vamos a preguntar, por supuesto, por cuarta edición, le vamos a pedir consejos, nos va a contar algunas internas y vamos a aprender un poco de qué se trata esto de diseñar un juego que sea un poco de crunch y un poco narrativo. Quédate ahí y míralo. Well, Rob, thank you for being here. Uh, our first question for the day. You are one of the designers of Thirteenth Age, which, by the way, is a really hard word to say for someone that speaks Spanish. So we are going, we're going to work on that Thirteenth Age. What would you rather call it? <laughs> no, 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 we, we can call it. <laughs> we, we, we want to practice it, so uh, it helps. Edad 13, no. Edad 13, we can call it. <laughs> Okay. Very, very good. Uh, and, and you designed this with uh, Jonathan Tweet, which, by the way, we had him in, in uh, the, this show. It was our first interview uh, in English. And you are now uh, launching a Kickstarter for the second edition of The Fint Age. And uh, before we, we dive into what is The Fint Age, uh, the changes uh, it, it has, or your story, as a designer or the way you think about game design, how would you define Therathin Age in your words? I mean, what is in your words this game? Sure. Um, Jonathan and I have played in the same gaming group since around 1997, 1998. And um, we both in the middle of those, <laughs> during that time, we both designed or were lead designers of editions of Dungeons and Dragons. And our table is a little bit of a traditional table in the sense that when we try to play other games that aren't D20 rolling um, fantasy games, our group sometimes doesn't entirely follow us. Uh, we're, you know, so what 13th Age really is in a weird way is Jonathan and I designing the game we want to play together um, at, at, our, at our Wednesday night gaming table. Um, it is a faster paced streamlined version of Dungeons and Dragons D20 rolling combat. I mean, it's obviously very, you know, the, the basics of like rolling a D20 and are similar, but you know, we get rid of things like range. We, we cut to the fun parts. You know, the mo models are either far away where they can shoot each other nearby where one move will take them or they're engaged. You know, we don't deal with counting squares and doing all that jazz. We did that at the, when we worked for the corporation, we had to public, we had to make miniatures and maps and all the other stuff that we could sell. Well, we don't, you know, when we did 13th Age, it was for us. It wasn't, we weren't trying to back up an entire line of products. Um, it also, the game we wanted, other things that we always wanted to do, we always wanted to make a game where every single hero will have something unique about them. The game starts off with every player, not only choosing a character in a class, but also saying, I'm gonna be, One unique thing about me is that I'm the only halfling knight in this entire empire. And then the game master's like, oh, well, why is that? And the player says something, and the player says, okay. And all of a sudden, the game master's entire picture of what the campaign world is and what the campaign might be gets changed. The player is, in essence, telling the game master what I, they want the story to be. And it, it, when it's played well, it ends up with that same kind of feeling of like, when you read a, a good fantasy novel, there's something different about the heroes and that's going to come true later on in the game um so really what 13th age is it's a d20 rolling crunchy game um so that you can choose character powers and choose what to do on a round by round basis but there's also storytelling aspects of it that work for the players who mainly are there to play stories and it's sort of like trying to get both people give both sets of people enough that they're interested in and that's what i'll say That's the game. <laughs> There's a lot more to, you know, to like the specifics, but uh, the, that's basically it. Well, going maybe a little bit on some of those specific, what would you tell that m makes 13th Age <laughs> stand out from the rest of the fantasy RPGs? You, what, you, you just 
uh, show us a glimpse of that, but what kind of stories can people tell better with uh, or with pure hurdles in the game? I'm not positive it's about telling stories better. I do know that it's partly about telling stories sooner. Um, when you're playing 13th Age, you're not only like when you're setting up your character, choosing a one unique thing. You also have relationships with the characters we call icons. Icons are like fantasy archetypes. If you think about it, think about Dungeons and Dragons worlds and fantasy worlds. Nearly all, in many of them, there's some like highfalutin wizard character who's the master of magic. In 13th Age, that's the Archmage. There's also usually uh, a sovereign, a monarch of the elves. 13th Age is the Elf Queen. There's a Dwarf King, there's an Emperor, there's a High Druid, um, and there's a Prince of Shadows who people oftentimes don't even believe in, but you know, things seem to happen and uh, go missing quite frequently. So, first level characters start out with relationships with those icons. And it's usually not the icon themselves, it's usually the organization that the icon's part of, that they're dealing with. But from the very start of the game, you've got a stake in some of the conflicts that really matter in the world. And um, I think, I mean, reports we've had from players are like, oh, very first session of the game felt the way it usually feels after we've played four or five or six sessions. You know, I've already got these and uh, these things about my character that really give me a toehold in the world and that let people like start expressing themselves. Um, I would say in a weird way, not weird, it was just like the, the truth is that our skill system is also another example of that. Um, we didn't we didn't want to give you a skill in, oh, I'm trying to remember old skills, horsemanship, uh, riding, or uh, sneaking, uh, stealth, you know, we didn't do that. Instead, we said, tell us two or three things, maybe four if you're crazy, or five if you just like spreading points around, about what your character background was, you know? And so ones that I enjoy playing have played is like, well, I was a, a sous, uh, uh, I was gonna say sous chef, that's not gonna be a good word. I was a chef in a monster restaurant. And, What I'm telling the game master is anytime there's something about, oh, let's say monster part identification or cooking, maybe, or um, procuring strange ingredients that we will turn out to need. And if there's a skill check involved with that, I get to add my points in chef in monster restaurant. <laughs> um, and so what happens is that the game master will say, why? Why are you adding your points in chef and monster restaurant? And the player says, well, because of this. And then they make up other things. I mean, and the fact that I'm going like this indicates that this type of role playing to a player who's very like cut and dried, like these are the rules and those are the, and they shall always stay. No, no, no. This is really fuzzy storytelling stuff that's deliberately fun where, you know, your players are trying to like get advantages by say, by stretching their backgrounds. But when you let them stretch their backgrounds, that gives you an opening as game master to then mess with them with a story later on. You know, the more they say about that restaurant, it's like, well, it sounds to me like you probably left there without paying your tab, you know? So, you know, so the backgrounds also inform what happens in the game that the game master and other players can go ahead and work on. Um, yeah, I haven't taken advantage of a couple of the backgrounds in my current game. Like one of um, that I just, I was just filing to think about what I'm going to do to them. So there's an, there's one of the things about 13th age, therefore, is that the, uh, the player characters are set up from the beginning to interact with the world and to tell the game master what they want the game to be about. That's what your backgrounds do also. Um, And that's an, it's, those are things that we kind of made intending that they could be stolen. When we designed 13th Age, we were not, we were not planning to design a game line. Um, we thought we were doing one book. And therefore, that's why we put everything into a single book. Well, and then I put the monk on the cover and failed to finish the monk on time which meant there was going to be a second book, you know, so, um, and there, but for example, when I say that combat in the game is something that other game, other, other D20 rolling games could like go ahead and steal stuff from 13th age and profit hugely. Um, 
the escalation die is an example. Um, combats deliberately start out balanced in favor of the monsters. Um, the math is not favoring the player characters. And whenever I start a battle, not whenever, but frequently with my players, the, the first round of combat scares them to death. And what I hear is these words, things like, this is a, a quote that this keeps getting reported. This is a bullshit game. These are bullshit rules. You're a bullshit ref. I'm out of here. <laughs> and the fact is, though, at the end of the first round, the escalation die, and I don't have my giant escalation die here. It's at my, it's, it's like that big, big red thing. Boom, turns to one. And that's at the end of the first round. At the end of the second round, it goes to two and then three and four. Only the player characters add that bonus to their attacks. And some of their best powers don't actually come up until the escalation die reaches three or two. And if the escalation die has to read, reach five or six, that better be a really, really good power. Um, so, but there are also occasional monsters where it's like, ah, don't let the escalation die get to six. <laughs> it's not going to be good for you. You need to finish this battle. And so uh, that that timing example for, you know, I had started using that at the end of fourth edition um, because fourth edition combat actually did have a tendency to sometimes bog down as powers had been used and you're just sort of doing the same amount of, you know, so that it helped. Um, there was a, uh, another guy in our group. It's unclear whether he made it up or whether I made it up. I think he did, but I, I'm not positive. And anyway, so that helps a lot. Uh, we are heading now to the second edition of the game. Yeah. The Kickstarter will launch on May 7th. And you already talked about some mechanics, but what are the main updates or changes you made into the system in the second edition? Wow. Okay. I think I can say something about what the goal was and how that goal transformed. <laughs> uh, my original goal, there's a, there's a, what is a, it's, uh, there's a miniatures game from Osprey called Frostgrave. And the guy who published Frostgrave second, he published McCulloch, I think is his name. He published um, second edition. And when he did it, he said, the reason I'm doing this is because I realized, I looked at how people are playing and I realized that there's all these interesting spells I designed that nobody's choosing because they are not good compared to the spells that people are actually choosing. So when I started off second edition, I hadn't ever really, I was like, I, that's my goal. My goal is to make the character choices interesting. Um, so that so that the fact yeah, right right now you know you can pretty clear that which of these particular spells is good well it's the one that those are the good ones and are these spells any good how would we know no one uses them oh that means they're not any good so you know i wanted to be go ahead and like raise the amount of choices of that player characters and had so then i got jonathan involved and uh jonathan was definitely not Jonathan was willing to go to stick to my uh, my my first design goal was that all the stuff that had been published earlier would stay compatible but simultaneously Jonathan really wanted to go ahead and think hard about every aspect of the game and he did and we talked about everything so what has happened is on a system-wide basis all the monsters are now interesting in the sense that we had a lot of sort of vanilla, eh, why is this here? That effect never comes up. You know, you roll the die, but did it happen? No, it didn't. Well, now it's very likely to, <laughs> you know, and the different monsters are all in the core game going to feel very, very different from each other and be doing really interesting things. Um, player character classes that didn't work at all, because I tried a couple design stunts like I did, I did a design stunt with a fighter. I made them completely different than anybody else, um, but it didn't exactly work. It was like, if you had to just go ahead and grade every single power in its approach, it was like, oh, that didn't work at all. You know, it's like, and so the, the new fighter definitely works a heck of a lot better. Um, sorcerers, wizards, what's the difference? Well, we had a difference, but now it's really big and you'll be able to very much tell. Um, Magic items. Here's an example that I would never have gotten to without Jonathan. Uh, in fantasy games, a lot of times, and, and in, in Dungeons and & Dragons and 13th Age and other games like this, everybody wants magic weapons. 
everybody wants magic armor. It's just like kind of like, of course you want that. That's what you it help. It's the thing that helps you the most, right? Jonathan was like, that's ridiculous. I want to make the other items matter. And he we worked at it and now they do. Now it is an actual interesting thing of like if you have a tr if you end up somehow having a choice, you might want that cloak and you might not want that shield because the powers they have do not suck. They are they they are bigger powers in some cases than the weapons and the armor have because the weapons and the armor are always coming up. So therefore, you know, and Jonathan's vision of the the treasure and stuff like that was you know, I'm famous for being a real stingy with treasure or making it attack my player characters when they get it. Long story, but it happened and I really regret it. Um, and so, but, but Jonathan saw through that. Now you asked me, what are the biggest things in second edition? It's two books, okay. not one, because it turned out that Hellgrain is capable of publishing 400 page books, but now that they've done it recently, with Swords of the Serpentine, they'd really rather not. <laughs> so we've we're we've split it up into a player's handbook and a game master's guide. You will need both of them at the table to play a whole game. Um, you know, because some of the rules are in the game master's guide and a lot of the rules are in the player's handbook. Um, one of the biggest things I think that was wrong. I'm gonna say what was wrong with first edition? Okay, this is I wonder if I've confessed it in so many words. Yeah, probably, but here we go. So, one of the main things that, like, the indie style, we, we talked a lot about how, hey, this is a blend of, oh, let me put on marketing voice. Oh, 13th Age is a blend of crunchy D20 rolling combat in indie style storytelling mechanics. Problem was, one of those big indie stories telling style mechanics didn't work too well and it wasn't that it didn't even work it's that we explained it so badly that whenever i talked to like 13th age game masters people who were running the game for years campaigns that are eight years old multiple campaigns they love it i'd say how do you roll how do you handle icon relationships different answer from every single person because our rules were so nebulous that essentially people had to kind of make it up for themselves. And if they were good game masters who liked the, the world and the rest of the system, they did. You know, some people use them as action points. Some people use them as, oh, no, we don't even deal with that. Some people use them with like, oh, um, oh, yeah, every once in a while, I give them a bonus in combat. You know, I was like, no, no, none of those are the, actually the rules. But the rules were very difficult to find and not really clear. And for example, we told people to do something every single session they played that we now understand has to instead happen once every arc, which is what we, the new word for a day. It's like, it doesn't happen every session. If you only play two big combats in a session, well, you're then going to start the next session with the same icon relationships because we just, it was too much. Game masters couldn't handle it. It's also now completely in the hands of the players the players remember what icon relationships they have connections and they say when they're going to use it and then if they roll a twist which is a one through five and a d20 the game master gets to add something else to the story so it's an it's a narrative tool and we actually are we have around 25 or 30 pages now of examples broken out into all the different ways players may want to add narrative elements to the story using icon connections and then analysis of why that was interesting and then sample twists you know to say okay this is what the player character thought they were doing when they converted this orc ward they told this orc war drummer to go to the priestess and you know and this is what happened with a twist so um that Let, that is a, it's a big deal for the game yes. Let, let's get back to to something that you've said, uh, not only of uh, second edition, but also uh, in the past, this this blend, this this um, uh, mix, this innovation that Thirteen Age did, because it it really speaks about you and Jonathan's history as as designers, right? Jonathan as as the designer, one of the designers of third edition D and D, you as the lead designer of of fourth edition, and things that that you took things that you changed, things that you innovated. And 
13th Age, first edition came out in uh, 2013, if I'm not mistaken. Still... I believe so. At least that's what it says on the copyright. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this, this was a, a different time for TTRPGs. It was before 5th edition D&D, which, I mean, for several reasons, uh, it blew up and yeah. the, the market grew and it had a lot of interesting ideas. How did all of these changes in the TTRPG industry, 5th uh, edition D&D, &D, uh, the, the growth of, of the market, inform your design of the second edition of 13th Age? Because you are standing in a different ground now, right? I mean, it's it's a different industry. How, how did it change your relationship with the, with the game? I mean, uh, is there any trend, for example, that you say, hey, people are playing like this now, and, and when we thought about the game for the first time, we actually uh, thought it would work for people that play in other way. How did that work? Interesting question. I feel like one of the, okay, one of the answers I, I, was my rather long-winded discussion right now of icon relationships, icon connections, is, is connected to the answer to your question. Because the things that 13th Age offers that aren't necessarily present in some other versions are the things that the player character, the players make up and add to the game. And on a session by session basis, the, the, the narration that the player gets to add when they realize, oh, I have an icon relationship with the Elf Queen, you know, and I'm going to be able to like go ahead and use it right now. And I, and I could give some examples right now. But because we hadn't handled that right in the first edition, it's almost like I think that it's going to be appearing almost for the first time in the second edition. It's like there were some pages dedicated to it, but since no one actually used them, you know, there's an element. And well, wait, and I can't say that. Somebody's going to come up to me and go, I used it and I really liked it. And I'm going to say, how did you do that given that the one of the main rules was lost in a single paragraph and it wasn't even the lead sentence you know the paragraph you know it's like i applaud you um so i think because we wanted to lean in to the storytelling pieces that give players an opportunity to tell the story along with the game master it was really important to go ahead and finally get this right and to be totally honest, I mean, we're, we're putting out the second playtest packet alongside the Kickstarter. And when I say that I think we got it right, I think we got it right. But I'm going to hear from people who are trying to use the rules. And <laughs> if they're not working out for them, then I'm going to then I'm going to have adjustments to make. Um, I think in a, in a sort of a bigger way, the weird thing is D&D &D is such it's it's such its own beast in a weird way in role playing. And I don't know if that's going to change or not. Um, there are many players who, who there are still a certain set of players who only play Dungeons and Dragons. You know, it's sort of like that is what they play because that's the thing. But because of the splintering of the additions and the fact that Paizo essentially used third 3.5 as a model for what was the original Pathfinder was, there's more people playing games that would say, oh yeah, I just played D&D. &D. Actually, they're also playing these other games, you know, and 13th Age is one of those. Um, if I, when I look at Pathfinder right now, Pathfinder 2 is a very interesting game because it is actually much more like 4th edition um, than, there's a lot of stuff from 4th edition that's in Pathfinder. Um, now, it's still got some of the other things that are left that are part of 3rd or but it's not like this. <laughs> I mean, fifth is back like second edition, you know, and and so there's this weird thing where Pathfinder is now more like 13th Age than fifth edition is like 13th Age in a, in a strange way. Um, uh, but I'm not positive that people that that's what perceived by the audience exactly. It's just like system wise, it's kind of true. Um, one of the other pieces that I think that we really emphasize when we talk about the sort of spectrum of what's happening now. We try to make 13th Age a game that's fun for the Game Master. Um, the Game Master doesn't know what the players are going to add to the story, and the players have mechanisms by which they can do that. 
and possibly surprise the game master. The monsters have the same kind of thing. You don't actually know when a monster starts to fight what it's going to roll. And when it rolls, it's natural, even if attack will do one thing and it's natural odd will do another and it's like the game master gets to be there and be like oh this is what's happening and it's a surprise and i think that's those are pieces that i value a lot in gameplay and i'm not positive the extent to which other systems deliberately create those moments so i'm going to call that an answer to your question like a politician i'm going to say i just answered your question next question please <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So, I played a lot of I played a lot of Thirteenth Age on video screens, uh, you know, during the pandemic. And um, but I have to honestly say I'm not entirely positive if I learned lessons that made that easier for the next for the next thing. You know, like I would really have to say, did I actually spend a hell of a lot of time really figuring that one out? And the answer is not yet. Not not completely. It worked. It worked well enough. You know, there may be there may be things that that people are doing or can do that will make that even better. But so far, you know, I'm, I'm not positive. That wasn't really one of the um, the driving forces for second edition. That was not a driving force. It's sort of like you can play it on a table. You can play it online. Mm, experience is pretty similar, except for the social interaction. Of course. Yep. Yeah. It matters a lot. It matters so. You, uh, Fede mentioned, and you, you, you just did uh, 4E, and in recent years there has been some revisionism from of, of, of 4E. Creators like Matt Colvin, for example, have said they liked uh, 4E a lot. We interviewed uh, James Introcaso from MCDM, and ah. and the new game uh, they are designing was clearly influenced by 4E. <laughs> Uh, even down to some of the graphic design choices. So, right. How how do you view the the criticisms the critics uh, the criticism that for E faced when it originally came out? I feel like there were there were a couple things we could have done that would probably have made things a little better. Um, one of them was something that I've really tried to really bring out in 13th Age, where character classes feel very different because they mechanically operate differently. Um, I knew when we sort of ran out of time and hadn't gone ahead and done as much to like make the distinguish the classes that we that, that we'd lost an opportunity. And that was a factor of not getting the design done quickly enough. The schedule was set. The books had to come out. The the key elements that helped fourth edition pull together, you know, we we got the the character power framework, and then that framework was the same for all the classes, and it was like, oh crap, that was that was not the greatest. Um, for other things, I mean, one way to look at it is that I've always third edition was a language. Um, because it was such a uh, power okay it's a simulation to some extent it aims to go ahead and give you the feeling that if there's something real that's happening in front of you you can model it with this particular game mechanic you know that that ogre has a number of hit points and the number of hit points they have is if they have 20 hit points and you have 20 hit points those hit points are very much the same um some of those monsters have they have class levels they have you know the Uh, the mechanics for the creatures are pretty much close to the same as the mechanics for the heroes. It's a, and the language, therefore, is that people learn to speak it. Like third edition was sort of immersive in that weird way of like, I now speak third edition and I get it. That's not what fourth edition offered. Um, fourth edition was, I sort of looked at the, the, the divine challenge and was like, I'm not going to do a better simulation than third edition. And I'm not actually that interested in trying to do a better simulation than third edition because people already speak that language. We're going to make something that's more of a game. And, you know, heroes and monsters are very different in fourth edition. And it's no longer, it was no longer a language that the people uh, could easily pick up and then describe the entire world using that same style of effect um i think that 
one thing I learned that was surprising was that to me, and I should have heard, I should have been aware of this, but uh, when you're deeply, deeply, deeply changing a game system, don't also change the world. We simultaneously super, super changed the game system, which is one thing about the language that people use to understand their role playing experience. And then we did things like, and you know, that guy's not a demon anymore. And devils work like this. And the cosmos is like that. Now, those things were all like possibly good world building decisions. They could have, they, they could be good world building decisions, but the combination of changing everything, <laughs> you know, of having people come in and be like, oh, it's all gone. <laughs> you know, I thought I knew Dungeons and Dragons, but apparently I don't. You know, that wasn't a feeling that people liked having. And I don't necessarily blame them. So, uh, uh, Rob, uh, about this, you, you answered many of the criticism that, that even I, when I was a, a player, uh, even I had them no? when 4th edition came and, and I really loved it. I, I, I have the the code I, there. I see something uh, right there, yeah. Yes, the, the DMT guide is there. So, yeah. uh, but uh, I interview politicians sometimes, so I have to, to ask a follow up question. Why do people, why did people start liking it? Uh, Again, I mean, Matt Colville started uh, praising fourth edition. Pathfinder is clearly second edition is is clearly influenced. Um, a lot of people are talking that uh, fourth edition had things that had a lot of merit that try to to change many things that perhaps were holy cows in the words of perhaps. Yeah, uh, well, Sean I mean that. Okay. One of my weaknesses as a game designer is that I'm pretty willing to talk about my weaknesses as a game designer. And another one is that I don't have much respect for nostalgia and tradition. I'm afraid. Not completely. I mean, I started playing D&D &D in 1974 with the original Brown Box. So I sort of, I know what was there, but I'm not actually, I don't have the warm, glow, ro rosy glow that I have to keep things the way they were. Um, and fourth edition, was interested in innovating and it's an interesting and ob so obviously there are innovations that it did that are going to be worthwhile and and it's and when people go ahead and like take lessons from game design there's there's things to learn there um i find it really funny matt colville uh Somebody told me the other day that he was like pulling inspiration from Epic Spell Wars. And I was sort of like, I wonder if Matt knows I designed that. I just, maybe, probably, who knows? It was like, because so he clearly likes the things I figured out. So um, fourth edition was one of the first attempts to kill the OGL. The people running WotC at the time even had companies that were flying in on a weekend to like learn how to like work with fourth edition as, as the open gaming license. And that was the moment they chose to try to kill it. And they couldn't because it ain't exactly legal, but they did manage to make it uh, impossible for a long time for people to design things with it. So Paizo had been all set up to go ahead and be doing fourth edition material. And then they got essentially stabbed in the back. I mean, or or the rug pulled out from them. Pick your pick your metaphor, you know. But, but in a business sense, all of a sudden, when they were supposed to be doing one thing, they were told, you know, well, if you do that, you have to sign over all these rights, and it was like crazy. Nobody would ever want to sign that. And so, um, you know, so the reality is, in a certain way, with third edition, every other gaming company had every reason to go ahead and like be on board. Right. And the nutty thing was, is that. Fourth edition simultaneously changed everything and told everybody else that they had no reason to be on board. Do you think, uh, Rob, it's that it's a uh, mistake? <laughs> yes. Do, do you think that uh, if fourth edition hadn't tried to change the uh, the OGL to the GCL, uh, or the I, I don't remember the exact uh, words, uh, but uh, uh, it would have uh, it wouldn't have faced. Uh, such a harsh criticism do you think it, it well i think maybe a little bit less i'm not positive it would have like i don't think there would have been any reason for all the criticism to go away right um i mean i remember there's a story that i i'm positive that it wouldn't that all the criticism wouldn't have gone away um 
I've told this story in other interviews, but one of the funniest things was when the game released, um, nearly everybody at WotC was getting to have a big party in Seattle, but I had flown to England and like, I got to run a game in the Tower of London, which was awesome. I met all the Pelgrane people before I started working with them, like a bunch of them, and that was awesome. And um, there was a gaming store that brought me in to like run a demo. And as I was running the demo, somebody came and tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, we have a, we have some, um, some of our really, our most serious players are, uh, are downstairs and they'd, they'd like to talk to you for a moment. So I walked, I walked down the stairs and I walked into like a semicircle. You know how when people set up a firing squad? Yeah, you got the sort of semicircle <laughs> like that. And, uh, and they were, I don't know, somewhere between five and seven guys. And, uh, you know, they were all body language like this, you know, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and one of them stepped forward as a designated speaker. And I, I'm pretty sure what he said was, so we've played your game and we don't much like it. <laughs> <laughs> and like some part of my brain went, this is going to be an interesting ride. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so no, it would not have gotten rid of all the criticism. Absolutely not. Like they, that was an example of people who definitely loved having the the language of third edition. I'm sure they stuck with Pathfinder, or or kept playing third edition one or the other, but you know, used the pieces and stuff like that. And um, I, I mean, when it comes to people like being able to to mine things out of it and make their own versions, I mean, I'm sure Matt Colville will go ahead and like um, make things cooler. You know, version two will be, will, you know, version two of some ideas can be can be more interesting. And and of course, what's fascinating is that fifth edition, partly, probably part of the reason that there's sort of a, a note, a growing notice of what happened there is that there were many things that fifth edition opted to do that are not great game design choices. They are things that feel familiar to people who liked second edition i'm not a fan of second edition i mean i'm just i'm just not and i think that there are game design thing game game reason things that you know make it man eh, not that not that great a game on the other hand i do think and that might be partially a thing about how much fun it is for the game master i think there's an element of like um fifth edition for example is pretty fun for players once you reach a certain level um maybe not as much fun for the game master um there as it could be um and so i i would presume that matt colville's version for example in 13th age certainly are designed to like kind of keep the people who matter to have a game running the game master keep keep them happy and make make them more excited so and you, you said you've interviewed a lot of politicians what is your day job <laughs> I worked for yeah, as a journalist. I'm a lawyer, right? But, oh! but I, I worked uh, as a journalist in, in a radio station. So I, okay. I so had to interview a politician. Oh, very good. <laughs> All right. Okay, then. So, yes, yes. We, we, we had our first. It was a throwaway comment. I heard that. <laughs> yes, right. yes, it wasn't. So, uh, you, you, you got it. So, I think that maybe. Would you say that that for you was, in some aspects, ahead of ahead of its time? Seeing like the this this repercussion that this having today, or the, these recent years, that's much more different than was when it was received and it it was born. Wizards. Yeah. I, I I mean, for it's difficult. Okay, I, personally, I think that one could definitely say that. I'm not. It's not something that I think about or that I like would go ahead and be like. You know, I'm not going to like argue a thesis that yes, fourth edition was ahead of its time. I mean, I feel in a certain sense like Thirteenth Age has tried to go ahead and take the pieces of fourth fourth edition that I really thought worked and make them, you know, push them forward um, simultaneously. What's really interesting is that 
fourth edition was experimental without and i wonder if it knew how experimental it was like um i think the people who ran the company believed that everybody was going to follow along no matter what and and there was an element that's why changing the world and the rules and trying to get rid of the ogl like all those steps any one of those things could go ahead and like bring more people along um but you know sort of like none of them were done so if you go ahead and say was it ahead of its time it it certainly tried to do something new it tried to do something new and that was not what was expected <laughs> there was a, you know because i mean when we did like third edition had updated itself to 3.5 that was pretty much the same game it's just a bunch of the numbers changed and there were some key design decisions that sort of you know played a part but it was you had to be sort of invested to like actually really really grok the differences not so with fourth edition um i don't and i guess perhaps one of the surprising things about it is is that help me out here if you look at the entire gaming industry and you look at the history of the publishing stuff that had happened before that were there games that were trying to do just what fourth edition was trying to do i don't necessarily think there were exactly maybe there were but i'm not but we didn't have antecedents that were like oh yeah we're just we're doing that and so you know so when one says is something ahead of its time one of the things that happens is if you do a game like like 13th age now it's quote not ahead of its time fourth edition tried that <laughs> you know the stuff that pathfinder is doing right now pathfinder 2 has tons of interesting things that are from that are modeled on fourth edition no one said i mean i don't know what people are saying pathfinder 2 is way ahead of its time no it's not because it had a it had something to follow something broke the ground and so maybe that's what so maybe in a certain sense that's what people mean by it's ahead of its time now it also means it wasn't accepted <laughs> you know this is like yes congratulations a nice experiment you know blow up <laughs> so, so you mentioned uh, something in the answer thing. Uh, i'm talking about something new uh 13h was mentioned as one of the inspiration for daggerheart the new RPG by Darrington Press. The manuscript okay. says that Fifth and Age backgrounds heavily inspired the experience mechanic. Did huh. you ever think that it would end up influencing other games? Yes. Yes. I mean, that was one thing I was... Okay. Jonathan and I knew that we were designing it for that. Okay. I mean, we weren't... We didn't know we were doing a game that would have a line. We thought what we were doing was okay what we thought we were doing was that while neither of us were employed by a corporation we would design exactly the game we wanted to play together and that we would as much as possible try to create what we called a um, game master's toolbox and a game designer's toolbox we 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 feel like the escalation die should be used by other people we feel like the background system should probably be used by other people you're telling me the darrington press said something that's good you know so that was one thing we really tried to do consciously um and you know the combat engagement movement system which is where it's crunchy enough because people are rolling to disengage from each other. They, and if they just run and move away, they get hit with an, an attack. But it's it, but it's also not counting squares. That's another thing we thought. Well, people should just take this version. Why not use this? You know. And so we 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 de we definitely were thinking that. And you know, Jonathan would have told you that that's what he expected. Jonathan would have said, "Yeah, we're just doing this one book, and other people will steal pieces of it, hopefully." And that's great. And. Um, I think that now that we've had 10 years of realizing what worked and what didn't and how things were used, it's we've been able to go ahead and like do a better version. Midway through the process, we did 13th Age Glorantha. I don't know if any of you have... Um, 
And that was a similar, it, that, that experience, we actually did, of course, a much better job in 13th Age Glorantha of handling some of the mechanics I talked about that didn't quite make sense. Like the, the rune mechanic in 13th Age Glorantha, which is the equivalent of the, um, you know, you attune a rune at the beginning of a day is the, the equivalent of the icon relationships, icon connections in 13th Age. That works. You know, it's just like, yes, that works. And um, our experience with 13th Age allowed us, 13th Age Glorantha, so in a weird way, 13th Age Second Edition is kind of a little bit like our third motion, like not the second one, because we already did 13th Age Glorantha and learned a lot while doing that. Did I answer your question? Because man, I, I think I'm on a lost track. <laughs> yes, thank you. Good, I'm glad. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing. Uh, it's uh, so you 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 told us uh, uh, a little bit of this. Thirteen Age gives a lot of narrative power to the players. They the the relationship with the icons, the background, the one yep. unique thing of or two or three or yep. five you. But that 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 notion. Do you think that the direction of the industry is going is there, like getting more focused on narrative? Or well, let's just go ahead and say yes. I mean, the weird thing is, is that if you're you're not okay, if you're playing a tabletop version of a game instead of playing a computer game, then you either really value social interaction with people around you or you value doing the things that you can't do in a computer game as easily you know there's all kinds of experiences that are now computerized solo and put on old person voice when i was a kid we had like dungeons tunnels and trolls solo dungeons you know, and so, you know, when you roll dice and then you die, right? You, you know, <laughs> choose your path. And, but we designed this so that the mathematical thing, you're dead. Um, <laughs> and the, those experiences are now available in far, far better, far better ways through um, computer games um, of various types. Some of which, you know, you have a guild of 50 people. Um, and you know you're the cleric, so you turn down tickets to the concert because no one can like you know. And, and by you, I mean not me. But but I've had friends, you know, who are like it's like I didn't know you had a social life, but in fact you are the principal person in the you know of the entire guild. So the <laughs> the that those experiences aren't are different. And if you're playing at a table with friends, um. I, I feel like I feel like the answer could be that there'll be there is that there's sort of a self-selecting and self-generating thing that might in fact lead that to be true because if you're I don't know if you're a total power gamer and a mini maxer who wants to go ahead and conquer things I mean it's like you might you can do that and maybe there are people like that who who really enjoy being the only person at the table like that but the point is they're the only person at the table like that they're not you know they don't have the entire community based around that feeling anymore um are there games right now that are really really popular that completely blow storytelling out of the water and are just all about nope it's just the mechanics that matter for role playing it's a role playing game but it's only the, it's the crunchy it's the attack it's the fight what what game is that right now i mean it, you i mean one one could say that some places in the old school revival try to do that with more procedures than a narrative right okay Can I ask a question about the old school revival? How popular is it with young people? That's a really good question. <laughs> I mean, I really don't know. That's the, uh, I, I, uh, I uh, we actually uh, here in Argentina. Uh, I don't know how it is in, in the United States. Yeah. It, it's 
it is somewhat, it, it, it is some, somewhat yeah. popular. I mean, D and D and narrative play is the most yeah. popular, right? There is sure. there is no question, but it's not something that it's only relegated to the the old generation, right? Yeah. right? No, there there are young people, new or or new role players, right? The new generations that are that are playing it, but yeah. but it's it's a it's a great uh, uh, debate, right? If, if there is or how much room is there for crunchy simulationist oh, systems? One of the funniest things is this. There are other kinds of gaming other than fantasy. The fantasy is the most important, you know, the most important in terms of what people do, probably. Call of Cthulhu and horror gaming. I mean, Cthulhu has a story and it's a very interesting story and you're all going to die. You know, oh, wait, did you manage to survive somehow? Well, what a softy GM. Um, but you did go insane. So, but it's a story there. That people are playing, you know, that narrative thing. It's like when bad things are happening to the character, they're loving it, you know, in a way that is not typical of the Dungeons and Dragons style, which is much more like we wish to achieve, we wish to succeed, and and success in Call of Cthulhu will be like look a lot like failure in a D and D game. Um, <laughs> and you know, for example, if superhero games were the most popular genre, I think that we would be talking about games where there's an awful lot of boom, crunchy power stuff, you know? But even the superhero games that are, I don't know about Marvel, but um, the whole bunch of superhero games are always really based on the relationships between the characters, you know? And that's what Powered by the Apocalypse stuff is. You know, power, all the power, both Powered by the Apocalypse and um, other systems like that are very, you know, what, let's make the links between the characters really, really matter. And the, let's draw on those resources. So I think that that's the indie style touch. I don't think the indie style stuff is going away. I think it is going to become, um, I think it's going to become more mainstream in a weird way. And, um, that that will, so yes, I would agree with your, I, the answer to your question, Puel, Puel a long time ago is yes. <laughs> so, um, uh, I, I can say, I can say that I have a, a 19 year old friend that started yeah. with OSR. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, it makes sense. I mean, it's like for what it worked. Uh, but just because it uses the word old, it's also Sometimes, I think the funny thing you said that was funny was that like very, very detailed OSR systems because the original OSR systems were designing to be streamlined. Right. Yeah, you know, and then like getting There's, more and more layer on them is actually kind of funny. There but. is uh, this, this um, catchphrase that is used by very uh, modern OSR. It is quite uh, an oxymoron, right? Um, but uh, Modern OSR, uh, right. Yes, that is a uh, rules light procedures heavy right so we could talk a lot about it but it's not the point we're talking about you and, and, and oh, I, I, was, um... i've heard that I, I guess i really hadn't allowed myself to think about it until now okay <laughs> so you mentioned something that i want to talk about um the the, the game genre you assign it a medieval fantasy game that is something that sits really close to D D in the drbg market so what are the challenges a designer faces when trying to make a game in that trend, genre, like fantasy? Okay, the first thing is Jonathan and I cheated. Like, it is absolute cheating to go ahead and be one of the lead designers of the Dungeons and Dragons. There's only a few of us in the world, you know, <laughs> and and I bet you anything, Mike Merles will go on to do something interesting soon, and you know, and Monty Cook is already doing tons, you know. So there's there's that that's cheating. So in a weird way, I could answer your question, but but because we cheated, I'm not positive that that my you're asking a general question. I don't have a, and I, I have very specific answers. Right. You know, yeah. Yeah. I, so, so if you wanted to ask, I mean, holy shit. It's a good idea to have a 
if you're not if you're not one of the designers <laughs> of Dungeons and Dragons, it's a really good idea to have a beloved um, gaming podcast that attracts tens and hundreds of thousands of people that where you're and uh, that people like you know love following you. That that's a good idea. Um, uh, you can also be one of the designers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, so I mean, when it comes to the art of creation, one of the ways that I have phrased it oftentimes in my life is that when you go into a kid's room and you see a picture of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, you don't think to yourself, well, I've seen enough pictures of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. That sucks. Or I wish they would do something else. You think, hey, another cool picture of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. That's really great. That kid's got a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Turns out the kids like Tyrannosaurus Rex. With fantasy games as creators, I mean, I, I think the most important thing for game designers, creators, is that they they love what they're doing and it's what they want to play. Like, and if it turns out in a business sense that like you're doing something that isn't necessarily the best business move, it still might be the best personal move to like design something you love and, and, and have everything work out the best it can for that design and then learn from that. Maybe you do something else or maybe that, you know, takes off. Um, so I remember when Jonathan and I did 13th Age, Robin Laws would ask me for the elevator pitch. Um, and I'm terrible at elevator pitches, as you can tell, because I tend to answer questions coming in from three or four degree, you know, the elevator pitch. I'm sorry, I'm not stuck on an elevator with you. Why am I going to pretend? You know, fuck off, Robin. But <laughs> he kept coming at me with it, right? And I would be like, yeah, okay, you're right. I probably should know how to do this. Why don't I? I don't know. I'm a failure. You know, I just can't say that. So what I would do is I would be, I would I'd say, look, this, you know, in our case, it was the, the lead designers of third and fourth edition D&D &D designed the game they really want to play together. Combining lunch and story, there you are. That's the elevator pitch. Now, for other people, it's a lot harder of an elevator pitch for a fantasy game. You have to have a lot, you have to get, you know, what you have to tell the people the hook. You have to like go ahead and say, what is the hook? The thing that makes this different than everything else. And um, sometimes I think like, for example, with the old school revival, the old school revival has to a certain extent decided, no, we don't have to tell people what's new. <laughs> we are telling them that we are not new we are telling them that we are sticking to the one tr the faith as it should have been and never should have been changed you know and so it's like oh okay that's that's a pitch um all in a genre um the type of game that i own the most of is probably superhero games because every time there's a really, really interesting little superhero PDF system, PD, I, I buy it a lot, right? So I've got, I think I have dozens. And I haven't played many of them. Yeah, that, that happened. <laughs> I find them interesting, but I'm not like sitting there going, wow, I need to play this one. This one is so much good, better. And I, in a certain weird way, it's, I, I think there's an element of like, you know, Someday I'll, I'll maybe I'll find one that I'm like, yes, that one really, really, you know, made me want to play it immediately. But I learn a lot from like looking at all of them and like about how people process the same type of, you know, story elements and try to make power stories about them. So, yeah. Next question, please. <laughs> I, I really, I really like that uh, we had a little bit of a of a book ending there because you started the first thing you said about thirteen age when I asked you to to define it 
was that it was the game that that you wanted to play, right? And, and oh. it's it's the same thing that that you did now. So we have the we did the crunch of the interview now, but we had the narrative too, and we had a, a, oh. a weekend in. So um, the the most important thing <laughs> for now, uh, uh, Rob, where can people that are watching this interview right now find out more about? 13th age second edition which by the time you see this video will be launched in we'll kickstarter be launching so it'll be on kickstarter 13th age second edition there i mean i i think i actually don't know the precise page um pelgrampress.com they're the publishers and if you go to pelgrampress.com they'll have a giant banner ad that will lead you to um to the promise of entertaining role play to be delivered um not this year um i, I mean I, i think we're going to take until i want to get a little bit more play testing feedback and we've still got to do art a bunch of it and uh we'll be you know we should be publishing next year um and uh yeah so i, I didn't give a complete answer to that but i think that's good enough if people know kickstarter and can search 13th age second edition or 13th age they'll find it um 13th age 2e is my you know actually that's the thing i don't remember right now if this is going to be second edition or 2e on kickstarter i don't know one or the other you'll find it there don't don't sign up for the original for anything that says original 13th age because that doesn't exist this is we did a do you guys know we did a crazy kickstarter for 13 true ways before 13th age had been published oh no i didn't know that Yeah. Well, we had, I mean, it, and it it worked out. And we we wanted to do another a book together, and we were like, well, how are we going to manage that? Well, let's do a Kickstarter for it, even though the first book isn't out. Yeah, sure, because people had the um, they had the the original layout. So when people back the Kickstarter, um, either immediately, probably, or possibly a couple days later, but probably immediately, um, people will be getting um, some sort of draft of the. Um, of the current kicks of the current second edition and um so we'll be that and it, it it should be playable it should be <laughs> <laughs> and, and we'll try it out Rob, okay. thank you so much for being here uh, I, yeah. i learned a lot from from this interview it, it was uh, yeah. really cool uh, leon well I, i i don't know what what you thought uh, yes uh this is This is uh, such a treat. Uh, I, I enjoy everything that you were saying. Knowing the, the, the stories about the, how the thing were back then, yeah. th there is there is always that always will be uh, nice and 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 warm for me. Uh, so Good. Thank you. Okay. It was very yes, fun. Yeah, this was a very fun interview, and I thank you for that. You are very open, and and it's really amazing doing this in those terms, and 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 I really enjoyed it. <laughs> All right, great. I had fun. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.